Okay, so you guys should have uh, already uh, watched this, but I just wanted to, um, since we're wrapping up uh, flooding, I just wanted to go over a couple things and, and um, uh, summarize a few key points for us. So one, uh, we talked about flooding first, and then we've talked about, or you guys have seen, uh, done your readings, et cetera, on coastal flooding, right? And so um, theoretically, it's all flooding, but it seems most convenient to, to separate these two. So the, the interior flooding um, from before the break um, right, that's really primarily rivers, lakes, pr pr primarily rain-driven um, types of flooding. Coastal flooding can be rain-driven, but it's also particularly about sea level rise and tides and that kind of stuff. So it's a bit of a different, um, bit of a different beast. Um, uh, whereas. Uh, one of the big infrastructure challenges that we have with regular flooding is one, just the, the physical structure of the, of the watershed and, and, and the lay of the land, as it were. But um, the bigger issue in recent years has been how we've constrained the flow, how we've not allowed the water to do what it historically always wanted to do. And so typically that is um, channelizing or levying, constraining the flow, so as opposed to allowing a, allowing a sinusoidal flow of the water, it, um, it uh, what we're, the, the, the engineering approach was make water go away. Go, 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 go away. Go, go bad, bad water, go away, right? So when it falls in on the Oxnard Plain, when it falls in Thousand Oaks, and it falls in Oxnard, and it falls in Santa Paula, the idea is make it go away. And so for, for um, almost a century, that was the engineering um, restructuring of our waterways. It was to make them straight, make it go away, and get them away as fast as possible. Um, that was stupid, is one way to say it, or just dumbass is another way to say it, and that was incredibly non-sustainable in terms of the long term. Um, and so, uh, in our case, here in the Oxnard Plain, this, this flooding this flooding, this area that would deposit the tops, that would deposit um, sediments, um, is the main reason why it's such a fantastic agricultural place. So we have many deltas around the world, but this is probably one of the, is in the top 10 best deltas in the whole planet to farm, right? We, we maybe don't understand that, but it's incredibly productive. So a typical, really good um, soil, uh, 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 you know, fertile area to, to do farming and agriculture would be, you know, two, three, four meters of really good topsoil, really good um, alluvial deposits. Here in the Oxnard Plain, it's more like 10 meters thick. I mean, it's huge. Um, and so, so as we've cut off, as we've sort of, you know, made the water stay here and the water go from upland to down fast, we're also not letting other things that move around, including the sediments that are mobilized with that water, that normally would be would jump out of the channel, and then as that water flow slows, would be deposited, and that's the thing that's nourishing our wetlands, our agricultural areas, etc. And so that has um, uh, that's changed. Um, right next to campus is obviously Cayugas Creek, right? Over by Ventura is the Ventura River. And then sort of in between us, we have the Santa Clara River. But really, this whole area, the story of where we live here is primarily um, Santa Clara River. So the Santa Clara River has gone all the way from here to campus, all the way, oh, it has, the mouth of the river has moved all the way from here where you know, campus Point Magoo is, all the way over to Ventura and back and forth. So that river has, over the centuries, over the millennia, has, has moved and dropped sediment everywhere. So, so our channelizing that has all kinds of consequences. Um, and essentially we've done this, right? We, so, so the big challenge with our inland flooding is the fact that we've um, uh, apparently made it safe and, and, and done this to this, right? So we, we've, we've made it straight and we've contained it. So then we've built in behind it. We've put in agricultural places, we've put in um, cities, we've put in treatment plants, et cetera. And now, as we're getting more of these atmospheric rivers and the quantity of water is overwhelming that, that uh, you know, engineering application, it's going way crazy, right? And, and, and so now when it jumps out, it doesn't just deposit sediment, it 
floods the hospital and it takes out people's homes and all that kind of stuff. Um, we talked about 100 year floods, etc. Um, and so, uh, so we have this sort of transition where we have um, where the riverine flooding meets the um, coastal flooding. And this is most conspicuous for us in the Montecito debris flows and in the problems that we saw there. This is, this is a, a map from the early, um, early days after the Montecito mud flow. So this is, uh, this is um, 2018 after the 2017 Thomas fire. So this is in uh, January uh, after the fire. And these are, in the blue represents um, the riparian corridors, the channels. And then the uh, dots indicate damage, yellow, or um, destruction, which is the red. And what you see is obviously, um, you know, this, this doesn't take a rocket scientist, right? But the damage isn't equally distributed across the city. The damage is distributed proximate to those waterways, right? Proximate to where the water just over, overwhelmed the channel and then jump the channel. In this case, um, that the stuff in addition to water wasn't nourishing the soils, it was bringing down giant massive boulders and other debris flows. Um, and so, uh, so that's the thing. And then I, I think the black dots are where folks unfortunately passed away. Um, uh, a sense of the scale there from that, a sense of the boulders that came down. This is in the middle of a channel. Um, so this is, there was no rock here before, like the day before. Um, um, okay, so in terms of uh, what do we do? So what do, how do we respond to some of these disasters, right? So, so in terms of our, our inland uh, flooding, riparian uh, flooding, um, uh, the, the general concern here is to make sure that, you know, so, so the water, volume of water coming in we can't really do much about that, right? So the channel is as many feet as it is wide and it's as many you know, meters as it is tall and whatever, we can't really change that too easily. Um, but what we can do is, is try to not allow that to get even more constrained. And so uh, the typical approaches are things like this. So in this case, this is on the 33, this is up in um, Ojai, uh, 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 in the wake of uh, the Thomas fire. And so what we're doing here is we are, uh, so the culverts, which are moving water from one area to another, in this case, this example, this picture I took was from one side of the, uh, there's a creek just to my left where I'm taking the picture, and then it goes under the road, and then goes down to the main uh, river, which is down over here, like uh, at the bottom of this valley. Um, and one of those things were very small, and so they were getting plugged up a lot, which was allowing water to build up and then make a dam, and then that dam would collapse catastrophically and bring a bunch of debris down and cause all kinds of problems. So one, the, the, the tubes have been made larger, but then the other, one of the major preventions here is to try to keep debris, keep other things from getting into that um, engineered system. And so um, in terms of wildfire, we worry about uh, embers and things of that nature. In terms of um, uh, these guys, what we used to do is we used to have the culvert be uh, like on the side of the road, right? And so uh, underneath the roadbed, so that, you know, stuff would go down and, and very easy to build. You just essentially rip up, rip up the road here, put a tube in, have a, have a little ditch on this side and you're, you're good to go, right? But we realized that's pretty bad. So now we, now we typically have these things go Instead of opening underneath the roadbed, there's a 90 degree elbow and it points up into a little basin next to the road. And this has a big armored, um, uh, super, super strong structure to keep boulders and sticks and logs and stuff from getting in there. And it's much easier to clean out, much easier to service. And, um, and the clog is, on, is in the air. If, if, there is, if there is stuff that builds up, it's in the air as opposed to getting stuck inside the, um, the culvert. Where is my, hold on, where is my, where is my coastal flooding one I want to talk about? Um, this one, I think. Okay, 
So what we're doing, so our, our lab for this week, um, our main lab is the one that I had you guys looking at um, So um, the main lab that I have you guys looking at are some of our sea level rise viewers. So, so that, that was sort of like classic flooding. Um, the additional uh, challenge of the different category that we have here in, on the, along the coast is that sea level induced flooding, right? And so, so the sea level induced flooding is much more, has the potential of being much more all year round, right? Whereas the riparian stuff would be dicta generally dictated by say a winter storm or the aftermath of a winter storm or maybe um, when it gets really hot in the early summer when some, some of the snow melts or something very fast or something of that nature. Um, but our coastal stuff is sort of an uh, uh, all the time problem. So this is um, an example of um, what some of our coastline looked, in this case up in Alaska, <clears throat> what some of our coastline looked like about a century ago. And this is what it looks, that same exact glacier looks like now, right? So obviously we have a lot of um, melting going on around the planet. Um, I forget the number, 10,000 glaciers are retreating in Alaska and I think seven are accreting. So, so um, and this is going on around the planet. So we're, we're, we're don't, we don't have as much water frozen and as we go into the future, there's gonna be even less frozen. So one, we have water just going into the giant ocean basin. <coughs> Two, <coughs> sorry. Two, because of warming, <coughs> yeah. there's some thermal expansion that happens. <coughs> I don't know why I can't talk all the time. Um, and so uh, we have those things going on. Uh, the, it's important to say with this coastal flooding that the seas have always gone up and the seas have always gone down. That is absolutely the case. We have what we refer to, and, it's, and even though I know you guys should have watched this already, I just want to emphasize this, there's background sea level rise, right? So the stuff that would be going on if no humans were here, just, just cycles and changes to the planet and stuff. Sometimes we, the seas increase, sometimes they decrease in terms of elevation. And so we have a background rate, just like we have a background rate of species extinction if people weren't around. Um, a lot of folks that are these, like what Jonathan was talking about, these sort of conspiracy theory folks, they'll, they'll completely conflate the background situation with our current situation. So it's very important, especially with sea level rise, that you guys distinguish the two. So um, uh, what we're seeing, we have, a, we have a background rate, which is a fraction of what's happening now. And then we have what's going on for us right now. And so um, it's increasing. So we've about doubled the sea level rise um, in the last uh, couple decades compared to the, the, the previous amount. And we're, gonna, we're on track to have for that to increase even more as we go forward. So um, uh, uh, this is, th th these look very small. So we're talking millimeters, you know, we're talking about millimeters and, and all this and that. Um, that doesn't really matter. It makes a huge difference, right? So um, we're talking about, uh, you know, about this. Yeah, so we have, we have different models of, of what's going on. Just like with, with carbon in the atmosphere, we have different models, but all of them are going up. And so what we historically have used in California state, the state of California, is an estimate of about, about a meter, a little more than a meter sea level rise by the end of this century, right? So that's, you know, three, four feet we're talking. Um, that maybe doesn't sound like that's that much. That is tremendous. That is tremendous. So um, uh, that, that was the historic guidance. That was the first quantitative guidance that we have to do. So for folks that are doing stuff in the coastal zone, uh, the area near the coast, um, uh, they have to, if let's, say we're, let's say Caltrans and we want to put in a road or we want to repair a bridge or something. They have to say, hey, will this road survive three and a half feet of, if the sea was three and a half feet higher? Right? Um, that's still the official law, 
but in effect, we have a new guidance now, which is strongly, strongly encouraged that came out of this 2017 report. And so pretty much everybody is going by this, which is, um, which is that previous estimate is way too conservative. And it's actually probably gonna be more like seven feet. So, so call it more like 10 feet as opposed to three to four feet. That's what we should be planning for. That also may well be uh, conservative. That, that, that might not be right. Um, but one of the issues we have when we're facing these, these challenges, we're facing this, is um, I think perhaps you all and maybe me would say, hey, here's a bunch of models, whether it's climate change, whether it's wildfire risk. <coughs> Sorry, guys, I don't know why I can't talk. <coughs> We have some different modeling efforts, right? Atmospheric CO2, um, how vulnerable, how many houses are vulnerable to wildfire, you know, whatever the case may be. And we have a range, right? All models are wrong, right? All models are a simplification of nature. All models are a consequence of the assumptions we make that go into the model, yeah? And so hopefully, our model is close to nature or close to reality, but everything is, is, is gonna be wrong to some extent. As a consequence, we have a variety of, you know, early on when we model stuff, they're all pretty good. They're all, they all tell us pretty much the same story. But as we go farther out, those little differences in assumptions or a little bit of difference how we construct these models of flooding um, will, will compound on themselves and, and the differences will become more and more uh, explicit. So it's, it's a, and this is, this is, there isn't a perfect answer to this, but, um, well, let me ask you guys. Okay, so, so what, what should we use? So, so here in this case, we have some different um, uh, example, uh, different predictions for sea level rise um, uh, increases, sea level rise. Uh, which one should we use? So if you're a, if you're a city manager or you're a, a home builder or whatever, which one would you guys want to use? The, the blue, the green, the, the red? What do you think? I personally would say green because it's hard to get people to accept the extreme extreme. So if I can get them to accept like a little bit less than that, I feel like it's more feasible to get the general public okay. on board. So uh, Izzy has a vote for sort of middle of the road kind of thing. What about other folks? Okay, so a vote for the red. So hey, just want to cover our butts kind of thing and, and, and somebody else had a hand up. I was gonna say the same thing because I know you do work with the Bay Area. Okay, so, uh, so red. So, so uh, how about if I ask uh, red, uh, green or blue? So who, who votes red? Who, who would, would suggest going with red? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let me write it down. Okay, so we got nine for red. We got nine for red, and how many for uh, green? One, two, three, four, five. Five for that, and how about for one of the blues? One. Okay, cool. So most of you guys, most of you guys are, are like, hey, yo, red, right? I tend to be like, yeah, red, right? Um, 20 years ago, red was hard. It was hard to convince people to go red, right? Um, uh, for all the reasons, for the reasons that Izzy was saying, that like, hey, people are people, freak out and and they're like, what, you know? Um, uh, so so, when I talk about this, we, we have planning meetings on campus, and I say some of our models show that with the prediction of the sea level rise, and a, a good winter storm surge. Um, the water will be right by the parking lot over there at, at uh, you know, the, the lot over here near Lewis Road. And they're like, what, what do you mean, what? And they freak out and they get all upset. They're like, well, can you send me that model? Can you? And it's like, dude, that's just, that, that's what, um, I, don't, I, don't, I can't guarantee that's gonna happen, but that is a, that's a strong possibility of happening. And they lose it and they immediately don't wanna talk about it anymore, right? because it's too scary. It's like, oh my God, like what? Um, and so, so that's a real thing, that they're not being jerks or whatever, that's a natural reaction, right? Um, 
the blue is probably um, is, is super optimistic, right? We're going to control all our emissions. We're going to, we're going to, you know, get off oil and we're going to this and that and everything, you know, so it's possible, but we haven't really been on that trajectory so far, right? Nobody, no country is meeting their uh, Paris Accord uh, targets or anything like that. Um, so, so what, what has typically happened in most of the policy circles in the world is the, is that green, right? Is that I think a lot of people would like to go red, but they realize if we go red, it'll, everybody will just completely, or there's a strong possibility of people just turning off and saying like, oh my God, that's too scary. Doomerism, I'm gonna go smoke out. I'm not gonna deal with this, da 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 da, -da. Um, One of the dams that I, <laughs> I think I'll be dealing with for the rest of my life, because I have a new grant where we're looking at the downstream part of this dam up, in, up at Stanford. Um, it, we, we, we dammed the watershed, so we changed how the flooding would happen below the dam in, in towns of Palo Alto and East Palo Alto. And so then, of course, everybody just built into the floodplain. And, and we, we, we did some seismic analysis and found that, oh, if a big earthquake hits and this whole dam falls down, there would be a massive rush of sediment and it would, it would flood these mostly low-income homes in East Palo Alto super difficult to deal with though. And so two different administrators, who I won't name, at the university basically said, you know what, I'm gonna be retired by the time this thing hopefully happens. I'm, re I'm retired in like five, 10 years. This is an insane nightmare. I do not know how to solve it. I'm just gonna kick the can down the road, right? And so that, that, that's, a, that, that's a real phenomenon, right? That, that doesn't just happen at that institution with those people, that, that, that's a general thing. And so, so this is typically where we end up. This is typically where we end up in these predictions or in these, these guidance, the, the guidance for folks. Um, and you know, the guidance here for, for 2050 is probably okay. That's not a huge difference from, from the red or the blue. But when we start getting out here, that can be a problem, right? And as we've seen with the Francis Scott Bridge that was built in the 70s, um, it, it was maybe not the right sized infrastructure or the right sized boat passage channel, whatever the phrase is, for that modern shipping, right? And so, um, so uh, maybe some people said, I don't know, maybe some people in the 60s when they're designing that said, hey, maybe they're going to have a vessel, you know, five times the length of Sierra Hall here going through, going through this passage. But I think people would have said, you're, you're, you're insane. Like, no one would, no would build a ship that big, right? That, we're never going to have fires that large. We're never going to have storms that intense. And so it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, this, this would be the best thing to do, I think, right? This would be hedging our bets. This would be, if we designed everything for the worst case scenario, there could always be an even worser case scenario, but probably we're not gonna get there very often. Whereas if we design it for, say, the low situation, there's a very high probability that we're gonna be exceeding the design standards for that that home, that, that road, that whatever it is, very, very quickly, right? So it's, a, it's all that. And then the last bit that you guys mentioned was um, the whole issue around the conspiracy theory stuff, right? All this weird crap that now seems anytime, you know, a horrible disaster happens and all this bad stuff, and then people instantly start saying, oh, it's all a scam, and it's clearly all space lasers, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's another thing here, right? So. So uh, this sounds really scary, right? So seawater up to, up to the edge of campus sounds almost conspiracy theory-like, right? It sounds like kind of like, what? That's crazy talk. That's not what's really happening. So we have this, this weird world now where it's, it's getting harder to, um, uh, our major sources of information are breaking down in terms of the media, right? The media are less powerful and you, get, you guys don't um, typically, you know, get your news from the newspaper or whatever, you're getting your news from TikTok and, and Instagram and stuff. And so that phenomenon allows this disinformation campaign to, to go crazier. And so that, that definitely plays into here. So for, um, yeah, I'll just say that. So, so, so our, our climate change models, our, our future condition modeling, which is fundamental to disaster preparation, usually draws upon 
the IPCC's um, modeling, which is updated every few years, the International Panel on Climate Change. And, um, and the IPCC is a consortium organization, meaning that we, um, everybody has to agree. It's, it's not like a vote by, it's not like 51% of the, of the parties that go to the meeting agree, and then we're like, okay. It's what everybody agrees to. And so the intermediary levels are based on intermediary models of climate change, and those are the ones that, you know, India agrees to. India, not a huge, not a huge fan of, of realistic uh, climate change modeling. What Vladimir Putin would agree to, right? Not a huge fan of facts and reality and that kind of stuff. Um, what the former governments in Australia, which were extremely anti, anti climate change and stuff like that, what they would agree to. So, so um, we're also we're also sort of a bit uh, hindered by that that kind of stuff. But as as this stuff shows, which is I think the positive stuff, we don't have to be all woe, you know, all you know, woe is us, and oh my God, the world's ending, and oh my God, doomerism is over. We can choose to do something different. So we at at our level, which is what this is in California. Right? Um, I suspect, I don't know, I haven't, I'm not a political strategist, but I suspect what we're doing is we're starting off at three and a half, right? This was, you know, 15 years ago. And then, you know, a few years ago, we did, eh, maybe it's more like seven. And then I suspect in maybe like, you know, a couple years, maybe, maybe it's gonna be nine, right? So we're kind of like, I think with this approach, I think with California's approach is like not freaking people out, but kind of trying to turn the, the knob up, so so we're getting much closer to reality, right? So our guidance is much closer to reality. And if I if I tell you it's gonna, we're going to go from three and a half feet to seven feet of sea level rise for coastal flooding, that's scary, and that's oh my god. But that's different from going from zero to seven feet. So Florida, North Carolina have famously, um, uh, at various times in recent years, disallowed people talking about climate change. And they've specifically defined, for example, North Carolina, has defined the legislature sea level rise as zero. So it's all good. You don't have to plan because the, the state legislature said, ain't, ain't no problem here. And, and so uh, thankfully, that is not our state. That is not our home. That we're taking a more rational uh, ex uh, approach to this stuff. And indeed, places in Europe and Japan and, and and other countries are also taking a more rational approach to this. Um, so yeah, okay, so, so yeah, there's a bunch of things that, that drive sea level rise, um, but uh, in the video, uh, you guys watch this, but I'll just play this real quick because I think this is a great illustration. Talking about this stuff, in th this case, this is in the context of storm surge, this is in the context of a storm coming in with coastal flooding, but I think this is a very effective way to talk about this. Uh, this is in the context of a hurricane, but this, this idea of, you know, this is what we need, this is how we need to be communicating to folks, I think, right? We talk about how many millimeters of sea level rise. For us, that's great, but for the general public, they don't, they don't get that. Or they'll hear like a foot, they'll think like, oh, a foot, or they'll think like a degree of warming. They're like, ah, degree of warming, like, so what? I guess that's not that bad, right? They, they, we have to translate these, in terms of preparing for these disasters, we have to translate these um, technical terms into very easily to easily digestible um, aspects of stuff. Um, so anyway, yeah. And then there's some videos I have you guys watch there. Um, okay, so for our coastal flooding, so I have those three viewers that you guys are looking at. Um, has anybody played with those? And has anybody had any challenges with them or any questions about them? No questions about them. They make, they make sense. Okay. So, um, so I basically asked you guys to talk about some areas that seem to be, um, you know, particularly vulnerable or whatever in our in our in our uh, area. What, what what are you guys finding as you're looking at your, your models? What, where are the areas that are more, most vulnerable to sea level? Don't sound? Use that word. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so good. So what I'll say is what I'll say is those models 
are based on the data that we're, or the, um, the topography that we're starting with. And so um, it is possible to do things like um, sediment deposition, and if you take down some of the levees, you could have some of that sediment. When we have flooding, could, could do the nourishment. Um, the background rate, our background rate of sea level rise around much of the world is roughly equal to the sediment addition rate for a lot of our estuaries and salt marshes and things like that. So if left un unimpeded, many of our systems, even though even if we have some you know, relatively slow sea level rise, they, they, they adapt. They, they, they you know, augment soil and they just sort of go up or down. Um, even with under some of our higher rates of sea level, many of our systems can probably adapt, like our mangrove systems and things like that could probably adapt. Um, but we need to give them a fighting chance. And so, so, John, so the point about uh, Magoo is uh, that that's if everything stays, this, if, if the topography stays the same and the water just goes up. But we, 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 we're not, um, you know, blowing around the wind powerless here. We can, we can choose to do stuff. But good. Other thoughts or other observations you guys had? But, but yes, but according to the viewers, that's right. That's how you should do the analysis. That's how, I, I don't mean to say that, you, that, that you're wrong, but, but I, I do want to just say that that's based off the static condition when we first created the model. Completely agree. Completely agree. Other places people notice that that yeah. So um, again, it it uh, a lot of these things are potentially under our influence. So we in the case of the Santa Clara, the mouth of the Santa Clara River, we dewater that system for most of the year for the 14 miles from the water from the estuary to you know inland where the Freeman diversion sucks the water out and then we inject it into wells so that the farmers can, can have uh, clean well water. Um, so, uh, I mean, obviously it's important for the farmers to have well water and all that kind of good stuff. And, and also that pumping keeps the salt water lens, the subsurface salt water intrusion from, from getting further inland. So it creates this fresh water pressure. Um, but if we dumped more of that fresh water into the stream, that would, that would certainly help the, the salinity stresses for critters. Okay, good. So we have Magoo, we have the area sort of near Santa Clara River uh, mouth. Any other spots you guys found or noticed that were particularly vulnerable? You should check, you should check a little bit uh, like near the Ventura Harbor. So, so kind of, that might be what, what Izzy's talking about too, but, but I would look, I would look in that area kind of like Ventura, city of Ventura, kind of a little bit south of the main core city of Ventura. Um, th those folks are, are vulnerable too. Um, uh, one of the solutions people talk about, and then we'll probably knock off here. One of the solutions people talk about are hard engineering structures, right? Um, uh, do I have a picture of this here? No. Um, hard engineering structures. Uh, so walls. So this, so this stuff. So this stuff would be hard engineering, right? So, so this this um, uh, uh, poured concrete and and uh, rock boulders and that kind of stuff that would be that would be hard infrastructure or gr what people now call gray infrastructure. We can also use living things, right? So those mangroves you mentioned, those the salt marsh vegetation coastal dunes, these things are all living in the sense that the plants or the vegetation can grow and change. And so they can capture more sand and, and build up more sediment and, and that kind of stuff. So they're, they're, con they're now considered, the, in most cases, the better solution. If we have a bridge abutment right here, if we have a bridge piling, probably not so good, right? We probably want hard concrete around that because we don't want any erosion even possibly to happen around that because then the bridge would fall down. But with the exception of those very specific things, um, green infrastructure is the new is considered the new gold standard. And we here in Ventura are one of the um, actually U.S. leaders in doing this. 
So we're doing more and more dune restoration. We're doing more and more the managed retreat at Surfers Point where we pulled out the hard infrastructure near the, um, near the fairgrounds. Uh, and um, both was able, were able to restore more, more uh, of the natural community there, have it flood less so, that, so the recreational people that are coming down to ride their bikes or park and go to the fair aren't, aren't bothered by flooding as much. So we reduced flooding, had more vegetation, um, and uh, that's designed with sea level rise in mind. Um, we have other projects getting prepped, getting ready to go in. So that's all good. So, so I would say we are one of the places where we're able to try this out. Other parts of the nation, other parts of our state, people are like, no, we wanna, we wanna do this stuff. We wanna pour hard, hard, hard concrete. We wanna pour boulders. And that, that's how we're gonna fight it. We're gonna fight, we're gonna engineer our way out, right? I, I, that, that's, a fool's, that's a fool's errand, right? That's, that's, uh, that's not gonna work. Um, we're not gonna be able to fight the sea level rise. If you guys watched, um, what was it? Um, the new Blade Runner, right? Where, where they're, they're in LA and there's a huge massive wall that's like the, the LA beach is like a just massive huge slab and then some sand, right? So um, theoretically you could maybe wall off a few places to deal with sea level rise. I'm thinking uh, potentially like downtown Santa Barbara. It would probably be hundreds of millions of dollars, but theoretically you could do it. But for most of our coast, the Oxnard Plain, we're, there's no way we're gonna build a wall along the entire Oxnard Plain. That's just, that's just insane, right? Maybe you have a little gap, you have a little ravine or something of that nature, you could possibly theoretically think about that. But, but most of our coast, most of our planet, just, that's just not a possibility. And so, um, so yeah, so adapting is, is the more robust uh, approach here. For our small island nation friends, that's not gonna do it. But for us, we're, we're fortunate enough that we have a, a steep coast here in California. We actually can do this managed retreat. We can, we can take care of this. We can eliminate or, or vastly reduce the threat of coastal flooding um, and still have farms and still have all that kind of good stuff. It just means we need to, get, we need to start earlier rather than later. And if we just put our foot down and, and pretend it does, it's not, not gonna happen, that's when we're going to have real problems because then when it starts to happen every, every year, it's going to be way more expensive to deal with.